I'm Andrew. Um, I am from Queensland. I won't talk too slowly. And I won't, like, make every question... Sorry, make every statement sound like a question, right? Because, you know, you guys, are, we're all grown-ups, right? So who here is in dev? I'm so sorry. Who here is in ops? That's much better. Okay. So today, in this session, we are actually going to hear about the ops side of DevOps. Now, the, the developers, the, the crazy, sexy, cool, shiny stuff, everyone's like, yeah, we run the world. And they think that you know, DevOps is finally a way for developers to get ops to do things fast. And we let them think that, right? What we know is true is that DevOps is a way to get developers to do things right. Is that better? OK. So containers for a digital business. So I'll try not to have too many buzzwords, so you can put your bingo sheets away. But lots and lots of workloads are moving. And the theme of today has been the, in, the impact of the individual and how technology is transforming what we do and how technology is critical to being able to compete in the new world. And one of those technologies is containers. So who has never heard of containers? I've mentioned it four times already. No hands. Excellent. So there's, a, there's four main ways in which customers today are taking advantage of containers. You know, there's lift and shift. I'm taking what I've, I've already got, and I'm containerizing it because I want some of the efficiencies that containers provide. And that's kind of like that you know, re-platforming existing code. There's microservices where we are developing new applications, and very much that Unix paradigm of one thing, one thing well, it's small, and in, especially in those more complicated or complex applications where I've got lots of different pieces, and one application might be written you know, in Go because, you know, cool kids. Another application might be in Ruby because you're you know, masochist. Another application might be in Perl because you never, ever want to read it. And then you, know, you want to use Java for your mission critical stuff, right? So I can have a polyglot environment where I've got different components of that microservice architecture scaling at different rates, and I can have the best tool for the job. And containers fit that model really well, because we can plumb everything together very easily. Then there's mobile, right? Who here is developing customer-facing applications where you've got you know, consumer-facing, and you're not having some form of mobile first or mobile strategy. Right? More and more applications, and in the way in which the consumerization of IT is you know, driving this change, customers want access anywhere and everywhere. Right? And that's largely delivered through mobile devices. And so containers make this really easy to do as well, primarily because the load of applications that are delivered by mobile is very difficult to predict. And so containers are very simple and easy to scale. And then there's analytics. All right? So who here is doing anything around you know, big data or you know, data lakes, things like that? So one of the challenges with a lot of those you know, well-known systems, whether it's you know, like your Cognos or it might be Hadoop, you know, they do some things really well, but they're not really geared towards multi-tenant or different consumers or different data sets. So one way to have, you know, within an organization, have lots of different you know, customers of your big data platform, rather than trying to crowbar multi-tenancy and security, you know, row-level security into your big data platform, is just deploy lots of them. And containers make that very simple as well. Some of the advantages of moving to containers, you know, they're efficient. Right? We've kind of moved beyond, hey, it runs on my laptop to now it's running in my data center, or it's running on multiple clouds. And so we're able to drive a higher level, util higher level of utilization out of containers because we don't have that operating system tax for every workload. I can get better efficiency than, say, having a virtualization hypervisor or you know, cloud for everything. There's still advantages to doing that and reasons why you would, but you don't have to. Scalability, right? I can scale my containers much more simply because it is. It's an application. And more and more commonly, people are packaging the dependencies in with their container chain, right? So I don't need to worry about having different applications and sociability issues where they conflict on library versions, right? So those applications can scale to whatever they need to. There's self-service. This is a key thing in that you know, rapid agility space where they're doing that you know, 
test fast, you know, fail fast uh, paradigm of development, being able to just, I just want like a big box. So ops own the box, inside developers do whatever you want. I can do that for compute, I can do that for networking, and I can now do that for storage as well. But I still retain control while giving the functionality to my end users, who in most cases are application or developers. And you know, from a hybrid cloud perspective, one of the key things that we've been talking about, you know, Red Hat's got this idea of an open hybrid cloud. And we mean open, not just in terms of open standards, but open source. We mean hybrid, not just in geographic diversity, but technology diversity as well. So don't go and buy a mainframe in the cloud by just using one public cloud vendor. Use a number of them for both technical and commercial reasons. Right? Don't put all of those eggs in one basket. And so when I look at containers and some of the challenges that doing things natively in the container space, you know, there's, you know, different cloud providers have their own engines, but they're locked to that provider. So when I want to abstract up, I want to be able to deliver the same developer, the same application, and the same operator experience, regardless of the infrastructure it's running on. Does that make sense? Anyone vehemently disagree? Excellent. So there's kind of four patterns across an organization. You know, there's container platforms. You know, who here has deployed Kubernetes? Cool. More masochists in the, in the crowd. I kind of find it funny that containers started because developers wanted to go faster. But they only work on your laptop or A server, and they don't scale. So we came up with these container management platforms, like Kubernetes, that really focused on how do I operationalize them. But Kubernetes, you know, <laughs> the irony is, sucks for developers. It's great for ops. It's complicated, but it's focused on ops. And so Red Hat has taken that story, and as we'll see later, we've taken the container, the platform, and put it back in charge of the, the developer with what we call OpenShift Container Platform. There's cloud-native applications. So who only relies on third-party off-the-shelf software? Right? Common response for a room this size. Right? Everyone here has got some form of development happening inside of their organization. And you know, whether or not you call it DevOps or you know, whatever paradigm or you know, culture you've got, you're writing your own software and your own applications. And as I you know, discussed slightly earlier, that hybrid approach, where I want to be able to deliver those same services regardless of where it's running. Like take an airline with a booking and a check-in system you know, on mobile. It's got to be up. It's got to be fast. It's got to be resilient. But I'm a global airline, and in China, there's no Google. So I run on you know, Amazon. In North America, I run on you know, Azure. And in Europe, I run on you know, Google Cloud, right? Three different commercial contracts, three different technologies. But I want to deliver the same experience to both my end users and my developers and application people, as well as my ops, right? So being able to abstract away the underlying infrastructure and actually focus on the things that matter. Like, we have the world's best operating system, and it is more important than ever. But who would rather focus on the application than sitting there tuning a kernel? Every hand. You're right, excellent, right? And so we want to be able to focus on business innovation. And this is where containers can accelerate the way in which developers write and test code, because they can get out of the way all of that tool chain stuff, all of that environment setup, all of the, the security that they need to go through to actually get stuff approved and released, right? because we have a platform that enables all of that. So from a financial perspective, you know, there's a lot of appeal to looking at this sort of technology. You know, these are some of the case studies around the sort of return that you can get. You know, being able to pay back your investment you know, in under a year, like eight months, that's pretty good. right? Who here has a CFO that goes, you know what, take all the time in the world. I don't mind. Right? Right? That MPV thing, don't worry about it. Right? Being able to actually get tangible, measurable benefits. You know, like, you know, my boss and I were discussing this earlier about you know, how can you, you know, actually get some real world benefit out of these stats. Like being able to develop a third more applications with the same staff. Like that old catch cry of, you know, I've got to do more with less. Like, this is a way to actually do that, right? I kind of look at what we're doing in IT today, and we're finally realizing the promise 
of what you know, we were told 10 and 15 years ago. Right? The network is the computer, if anyone remembers that. So how do we do this? We keep hearing about containers from the developer perspective, and that's nice, that's cool, but then we actually need to run stuff. Right? So this is where Red Hat is the only vendor that has got this full stack that looks at the bottom all the way up to the top, from the, the base infrastructure all the way to presentation. Right? So you know, that XPAS layer across the top in green, you know, the business automation, integration, you know, what do I do with my data, how do I connect stuff, how do I actually go and use you know, other people's technologies, because you know, we're not the only vendor you're going to be using and we don't do it all. And then how do I actually make my developers productive? Right? So that's what the developers see. And you know, rightly so, they don't care about what's below the dotted line. But that's what our job is about. We need to keep those lights on. We need to make sure it's resilient and secure and performant. Right? So this is where what we call the, the Red Hat stack, or you know, OpenShift container platform, integrated with the other components of our solution suite actually make your life easier and tell that complete story. So from an automation perspective, you know, it's all Ansible all the time. Right? For those of you who remember, you know, Red Hat invested in Puppet because that's where the community was going. And pretty much as soon as we did, the community moved to Ansible. <laughs> so, yes! Right? But the cool thing about Ansible, it does Windows, it does Linux, it does Unix, it does networking devices, it does containers, it does private cloud, it does public cloud, it does your coffee machine. Right? It's, it's across your organization. There's no more of those silos in automation like you get with things like Puppet or Salt or Chef, things like that. Everyone is using it because it's simple. Right? It's the language of DevOps. Then there's OpenStack. So who here is running in public cloud? I know there's a lot of people not telling the truth. Right? Who here is running on legacy virtualization that their vendor tells them is private cloud? Right. And who here is running on OpenStack, which is actually a private cloud? Okay, so there's lots of people I'm going to talk to later. Okay, so OpenStack, as Martin was saying earlier, takes all of those as a service things that you are beginning to fall in love with in you know, Amazon and Azure and Google and brings it on premise. And that's cool, it's great. And it's that next generation of infrastructure as a service that you manage, or maybe someone manages for you, right? Like one of our partners. Right? Then there's the operating system. Right? So who here has heard of Red Hat Enterprise Linux? It's a small part of our business. Right? We get Linux, right? You know, Paul Cormier, our you know, head of products and technologies, often you know, jokes you know, privately, this, this would never leave this room, right? That there are more people working on the kernel inside Red Hat than some of our competitors have in their entire organization. Right? There is no one that knows Linux better than Red Hat. Right? When people think Red Hat, the prevailing view is often, oh, the Linux company, right? Now, who still thinks that we are just the Linux company? <laughs> no prizes for you. Right? But what we've done is container, oops, yeah, containers are supposed to be thin, they're supposed to be fast, they're supposed to be you know, scale. A full operating system, as awesome as what Red Hat Enterprise Linux is, is too fat, it's too big, and that's fat with a pH. You know? like, so this is where we've created a container spin called Atomic. Right? It only runs containers. It has SE Linux built into it. Who here still turns off SE Linux as the first thing you do? Right? No prizes for you either. Right? SE Linux, you know, to be fair, <laughs> used to not be very nice. In RHEL 6, and especially in RHEL 7 now, SE Linux is much more user-friendly, it's much more mature, and what we've done in Atomic is make it an integral part of providing mandatory access control and isolation between your containers. So you can't break out of a container and, you, and you know, take advantage of the host, and you can't break into another container. So you have that security and that peace of mind around isolation. Right? Atomic, just like full enterprise Linux from Red Hat, runs anywhere, bare metal, traditional virtualization, public cloud, private cloud. So you can deploy this stack on any infrastructure provider that you want. Right? 
I wouldn't re necessarily recommend nesting them just yet, but maybe, maybe later. Right? So if you think about containers, and you understand that containers are a Linux technology, and Red Hat knows Linux more and better than anyone else, and then you think, OK, so how do I take all that? That's what Atomic does, right? That's the core of what you know, OpenStack, sorry, OpenShift, OpenShift is, is built on, right? In addition, one of the big things that you know, we often get from security teams with you, know, you guys as our customers is how do I ensure that the health of the containers that I'm running is safe, right? So we have this thing called the Container Health Index. So we provide what's called a, a registry. So this is somewhere where it's kind of like an app store or a marketplace. I just go and say, pull container image. It might be PHP. It might be JBoss. It might be you know, you know, business rules management. You know, it might just be a web server, right? So we will give you a history of everything that's happened in that container image. You get like a score. You get a health report. And you also get things like C CVE and CCE vulnerability scans. Now, there are public registries out there where you know, up to a third of them have been found to be infected with either bugs or malware, like deliberate infections, right? So this is something that is very important. Then there's the data within those containers, right? Containers kind of started the same way cloud did. It's just stateless. And then the first one got provisioned, and someone said, you know what? I actually need some data. So doing storage in containers is often kind of like the, the third rail, right? I've got this big box that Ops has given to you know, the developer and the application teams, and I've got Polyglot. I've got all the languages that I can poke a stick at. I've got software-defined networking. I can scale my workloads. And then I need some storage, so I log a ticket. I go into this industrial age request wait state, and someone from the storage team goes, no. Right? Does that sound familiar? Right? Storage from you know, those traditional vendors, as good as it, is, as it is, isn't suited to the container world. And the reasons for that is, A, it's got to be fast moving. It's got to be agile. I need to be able to have a lot of variance in both the size, the uh, performance, as well as the consumption type or resilience of that storage that I supply to my containers. Right? Read, write once, read, write many, read only many. Right? It's both block and file. How can I do all of that and have it programmatic and have the storage team get out of the way? So that's where Red Hat Container Native Storage comes in. It's built on the strength and maturity of Gluster, and it has been specifically, you know, we have a, a separate product now, specifically targeted to providing container native storage. It runs as a container within OpenShift. It's got a RESTful API. It does everything, right? It's kind of like I've done for storage what containers have done for development, right? So the, the developer experience is the same experience across all of those facets of infrastructure that they need. Then I need to manage it. I need introspection. I need to be able to get performance information. I need to be able to make sure that when I'm doing a blue-green deployment, that you know, the green actually comes up and the blue turns off. Right? So this is where CloudForms comes in. But it's more than that. Right? This is where I can be able to say, here's all the pods that I'm running. Here's all the services that I've defined that users are consuming. These are the routes in which they use, you know, like the HTTP endpoint to access those. But here's the machine they're running on, right? the container host. That container host is running on this virtual machine or this physical host or this cloud instance. It's consuming these storage resources. It's attached to this network. Right? So I actually get not just a tabular form, but a visual graph representation. And I can filter that and you know, just get right down to the information that I need. And for those that are familiar with all the other things that the best piece of software ever written can do, which is CloudForms, it does a whole heap of other stuff around policy compliance, showback and chargeback, provisioning, your lifecycle management, right? For those who want to know what the worst piece of software is, ask me later, but it's something from a fruit company. Right? And so this is all of that tied in to Red Hat OpenShift, which is our container platform, right? So as I was saying before, you know, containers cool for dev, but suck for ops. How do I scale it past my laptop? How do I do networking? How do I make my microservice scale? How do I make it so that it exposes just the front-end service and not the rest? Right, that's where Kubernetes comes in. 
right? There are a number of data center container schedulers, and pretty much Kubernetes has won, right? And it's not just Red Hat saying this. This is what every other container vendor is moving towards, right? Even you know, those people that have, you know, they're not sure if they're a book about a whale or a software company, even they have committed to Kubernetes now, right? So it's a platform as a service. It's that developer-centric view with all of the tools that they need. It's also a container platform for ops as well, right? So this DevOps world is both sides, you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek the, the dig at Dev earlier, but the whole point of DevOps is that the two teams work together, not at each other, right? But everything that we hear and all of these new sexy cool toys all seem to be focused on the developer and, and forget the operator. We forget infrastructure. And this is why, you know, this is, this is what OpenShift does, right? It is both sides of that coin, right? It's enterprise-ready Kubernetes. You know, for the, the gents that have done you know, Kubernetes themselves, well done, right? But it only goes this far, right? So you've got developer with containers, you've got Kubernetes for ops, and you forget the developer again. And that's where OpenShift completes that package, right? We have an integrated container registry, similar to you know, what we're saying with um, Atomic, right? It's front-facing, so that you can be sure that the applications that you're building only rely on components that are safe or that you've approved, right? You don't want enterprise apps that just go out to the internet randomly and pick up some you know, PHP image that's got you know, heart bleed in it, right? So you want to be able to ensure that the container images that are building the, the container pods that you're actually running your application are safe, that they are secure, that they're verified and that's certified to run, right? And then for those that are you know, wanting to really drive automation from the developer perspective and they're using those CI CD pipelines, we can do all of that as well. So from the dev side, you know, they can take you know, their Git repository or Bitbucket or whatever source code revision system they want to use. Whenever they've pushed code and you know, released something, you know, OpenShift can go and do a source to image and release that. And that's hands off for ops, right? But we can also do binary deployments. We can integrate with Jenkins. I don't think anyone ever integrates with Hudson anymore. But, um, but that, that's like the full stack, right? So it's not just about developers. Containers are an ops thing as well. And it's interesting that most of the conversations that we have with our customers start with dev and stop at ops, because they're like, man, I don't know how to look after this. Like, you crazy devs, like, you're throwing this stuff over the fence. And that's when you know, we come in and the customer says, you know what? I actually want to do this properly. I want an enterprise container platform. And then we circle back and we go back to development. And they go, nah, man, I just want to do it myself. It's like, well, that's nice, but that's not how the real world works. You know, fail fast is nice for Facebook, right, where they do break stuff. But even they've changed their mantra, right? While agile and fast and you know, doing things quickly is you know, important, we still need to have a modicum of sensibility and do it right, right? Two sides of the scales. So you know, it's infrastructure and it's development. It's storage for persistent data. You know, a secure operating system tailor-built from you know, 20 years of experience specifically for those container workloads. It runs on any cloud. And this is really important, right? So I can go to a, a public cloud vendor and they have awesome tools, right? Pick one, doesn't matter. But it only runs in that cloud vendor. But your business doesn't. And why would you enter into a commercial relationship where you'll be holding entirely to someone else? Right? We learned that lesson. We broke the, the back of the, the proprietary hardware and operating system stack with Intel and Linux, right? That's what open standards did. Why would we go back and forget everything we've learned by committing to just one vendor? Right? So with a Red Hat platform, you know, not only is it open source, so you can see stuff, you can contribute, you know, everyone has got a, you know, a dollar in the game, but you can run it anywhere and you can change and you're not stuck. Right? And we can automate it. Right? Literally, when I was doing some demos last year, that if I did this by hand, you know, I'm a bit slow, so it'd probably take me three days. I was doing three of these an hour, right? Just use Ansible, bang, and it's done. And it works. There's no fat finger mistakes, right? As I learned the first time with subnets. So security, right? Who here loves dealing with their SecOps team? <laughs> yeah. Right? So this is where you can go to them and say, you know what, Frank? I've actually got, you know, Red Hat has 
gotten behind this, I have got a secure operating system. I can trace the history and the security health of my containers and the platform that's running on. I can get reports. Right? It's trusted content. You know, a lot of the software that we sell, you know, those, the, the productized open source projects, we also ship as containers now, especially in that JBoss middleware suite. So who here loves that JBoss EAP, our container, sorry, our, our Java application platform, is still shipped as a tar file? Right? Because how else are we going to do multi-tenancy? That's not what RPM packages do, right? So again, this is where containers can help. But we can also say, you know what? Don't use that version. We've found a vulnerability, right? So it's easy. Trusted updates and you know, all of the backing of our massive security response team, as well as our quality engineering, right? And you know, the stat that I was talking about before around 30% you know, or you know, about a third of some of those upstream public container registries where I, you know, typically that's where the developer journey begins is you know, vulnerable. So who's actually doing this? Right? Who's, who's actually done this in production and hasn't just listened to a pitch and gone, yeah, that sounds good? This is a slide from our Red Hat Summit earlier in the year over in Boston of just some of the customers that were speaking at Summit about OpenShift. Not that have deployed it. These are ones who are publicly, publicly out there saying, you know what, this stuff is awesome, right? So some specific ones. Finance, you know, Deutsche, Tele uh, Deutsche Bank, you know, they started with 20% adoption, and within a year, they've doubled that to 40, and their goal is to go to 80, 85% in the next 12 months, right? That's a significant uplift in platforms that they've moved. Who else has been able to move that many applications within a year? Right? We keep hearing about this two to three year life cycle of deploying new apps, and I'm talking to a bank at the minute about this. Right? That's actually what's in their business case, and that's why they're looking at the Red Hat stack to be able to accelerate that journey. Right? And they're in Sydney, and they're not Macquarie. We love them, right? but let's give someone else a turn. Right? So GovTech up in Singapore, and, you know, our um, Asia Pacific friends, you know, Frank Flymore, who loved Destin Asia? Right? It's kitsch, but it's cool, right? So you know, they've got this My Responder tool where you know, it's opt-in, but if you have a, a heart attack, someone who has skills like a medical professional that's nearby will be notified. Right? Apparently heart attacks are a big issue in Singapore, who knew? But this is, you know, we heard some stories when we were in uh, Ho Chi Minh recently about this has actually got tangible numbers behind how many lives they've saved. That's cool, right? That's, that's actually a real world people service, you know, government serving their citizens. Who would have thought, right? We've got Swiss Rail. Now, this is interesting that um, I, I flew in yesterday and I caught the train. And I've got a, an Opal card and there was $16.13 on it. And it wasn't enough to get to North Sydney. So I went, oh, drats, I'll put some money on it, here's $20. No, can't get through. I wait a couple of minutes, still can't get through. So I go to the booth, and like, oh, yeah, it takes an hour. <laughs> I'm so, so, sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't top up online. Just come to the booth. I'm like, you're getting paid or like... So I'm a customer. I actually like the train because you know, it's typically cheaper, typically faster than you know, our friends in the taxi industry. Um, to, to get from you know, the, the, the airport to the office. But there's a, there's a way in which mobile and customer-facing um, service is driving change in transport, right? So um, customers are wanting more from their public transport systems. And this is what someone like Swiss Rail is actually being able to achieve by delivering that extra information. Like I was in Boston you know, 12 months ago, and you can actually see where all the trains are on the network at the, on the, the screens at the train stations, right? That's cool. That's actually information that's relevant to me because I can go, you know what, I'll actually catch that train and then I can just walk across, that's fine. Pow information to me is power so I can make an informed decision. But I can do that because I've got an agile platform, right? So how can Red Hat help? You know, who here has never heard of a discovery session? Excellent. Who here has not yet signed up for a discovery session? All right, Jim, can you just pass the notebook around? 
So, from a, from a technology perspective, you know, we understand both sides of dev and ops, and we have proven results in actually helping customers achieve that, right? But this is where Red Hat, you know, we, obviously we want you to be successful. So, I'll skip a page. So, you know, kind of tongue in cheek about the discovery session, but this is something that has been delivered and built because of feedback from you, right? This is a no charge service where we get architects and consultants to sit down with you guys and say, okay, so where are you? What problems have you got? And where do you want to be? And if we can't help you, we'll tell you, right? Hasn't happened yet, but you know, 80% of those discovery sessions end up in some form of project that delivers real value. So this is, a, this is kind of like a gift to you, right? And you get some artifacts from that. You get some reports about these are things that you can do, and these are the benefits that you'll get from the investment, right? But there's no upfront charge, there's no commitment, right? But the value that we deliver, customers are saying, you know what, that's actually really helpful, right? You can get a demo. A lot of this stuff is available you know, in test drives. You, know, you can go and play upstream. Um, and you know, if you want to ask questions, you know, myself, Jim, Luay, we're, we're around, right? Thank you.